we are live on the Frugal Crafter YouTube channel. I am just hoping that this stream works out because I've been having um, technical issues um, all morning. So hopefully this isn't blurry and choppy and a big hot mess. But honestly, I there's, there's nothing else. I've wiggled every wire I can wiggle. I've, I've adjusted every antenna and, uh, and it is what it is if it's a total nightmare. I'll just bail out of it, I guess. Um, but let's keep our fingers crossed and hope for the best that we will have a good stream. Uh, I have Sarah here with me. Hi. And she is on the uh, other computer monitoring the chat and she will relay your questions to me if you have any during the stream. And um, it'll be the same as always. If you have a question, type the word question in all caps and then uh, type your question normally. So the YouTube you know, automatic spam folder doesn't boot you out. And if the moderators in the chat can help you, they will. If not, Sarah will relay it to me. If you have any questions um, about my new floral, flower painting workshop class, you can ask Sarah and she will ask me. And um, I think that's about it. All of the supplies and reference photo and everything are in the video description or on my blog. So um, that should be also the information you need for this, uh, this project. The paper I'm working on is the Aqua B 6x9 stuff. I actually, I was kind of scared because I only had like a couple sheets left and um, I buy it in like a 50 pack. So I just ordered some more the other day, uh, but I really like it. It's very affordable and it's 140 pound and 100% cotton. Um, so you can have that cotton painting experience without spending tons of money. Um, anything else we should mention? Uh, I think you got it all. Okay, great. We're going to do the same technique we did last week where we wet the back of the paper because that's like my new favorite technique now. I just, I just love it. It gives me such a good result. And we are going to use a spray bottle for that. You could use a big brush if you wanted to. Spray bottle is just a little quicker. And I'm working on a craft mat. I would suggest if you're, if you have a really nice table that you don't stick it right to your table, but you could stick it to your drawing board or, you know, take a piece of cardboard and put some contact paper on it or something just so you have like a non-porous surface or a surface you're not worried about damaging. I'm flipping that over, sticking that down and then I'm going to spray the front and wet that as well. I'm going to start off with a one inch flat brush and spreading my water all over here. If you have any bubbles you can actually lift up your paper and drop it back down again and that should get any bubbles out. It shouldn't be a big, big problem. You just don't want puddles. You want it evenly wet, but no puddles. We're going to start off with cobalt turquoise. Oh, when I meant to, I has been, I always have these like last minute bits of stress and I went to clean my palette. I, I got it sprayed, but I didn't have my rag. So I ran upstairs to get my rag. I've been up and down the stairs about 10 times before You're we getting started. Your steps in for the day. Holy moly, I am. And, you know, back and forth checking on the, uh, the antennas, seeing if my husband can hear me because I'm yelling up to him saying, wiggle the wires. It's not working. <laughs> And uh, yeah, like, so I completely forgot to clean my palette off. Um, so I'm going to start off with some cobalt teal. And these paints are new to me. Well, they're new paints too. They are imported from Poland and um, a seller, she's actually from Maine too, uh, sent me these. Um, I have her shop linked up in the video description. But these are very in inexpensive for a nice quality watercolor. It's like $55 for 24 pans with a tin. And she also has individual pans, so you don't have to worry about running out and then not being able to get them because they're from Poland. So um, that information's in the video description as well if you want some. So I'm just going real light up here with the cobalt turquoise. You can use cobalt teal or really thin down um, Prussian blue, but if you're using the Prussian blue, thin it down, then blot your brush off and then bring it to your paper or you're going to have big puddles that will get... Um, that will leave cauliflowers as you're going. We're also going to work this up from the bottom, but as we come up, we're going to we're going to angle our brush so that we end up um, not making this as good. Like the water line is going to be kind of like this and down. So we just want to make sure that that's what we're filling up, so we have room for all of our other stuff. There's not as much of a shift from wet to dry with these paints I noticed, which was kind of interesting. Um, and neat. I, I was worried that my stuff was going to come out too pale, but it wasn't an issue, which was nice. I do want the water a little bit darker than the sky, though. And I'm going right off the paper so I don't have to worry about any puddles. I clean my brush. And then I'm going to pick up some, uh, I'm going to pick up some gamboge yellow. You could use cadmium yellow. Any neutral to warm yellow will be good. 
just going to put a little bit in the sky up here. Not overlapping the, the blue though, because I don't want to have, um, I don't want to have green in my sky. So you're going to make sure you clean that brush off good if you're using the same brush. I do like to use a flat brush for this technique because I find that I can end up getting puddles with a round because rounds just hold a lot more paint and water at once. And now I'm going to grab um, a little cad orange. So I am using more colors than I typically would just because I actually was curious and I wanted to test out these paints. But you can mix if you want to. We'll be using like a kind of magenta pink color. So um, if you are going to mix, use that for your for your red. It won't give you quite as vibrant as, of an orange, but as you can see, we don't really need a vibrant orange. I'm just kind of like tapping in some clouds because it's a sunset. So the um, the light would be reflected. The sunset colors would be reflected in clouds as well. So I want to kind of get some of that up there. This brush is an espresso wash by Royal and Lang Nickel. Um, if you've been looking for the Menta brushes and you have an AC Moore local to you, they have them four for ten dollars right now, and um, and there's a twenty percent off your sold, your total purchase coupon today. So I'm not sponsored by them, um, but that, that's a pretty good deal. I have been sponsored by them in the past, though, just so you know. Mm. Uh, and now I'm going to grab a little bit of magenta. Actually, this is called Geranium Lake in this set, but it's it's kind of like a magenta or a quin, um, quin, quin violet, I would even call it. But it's very magenta, adding a little bit of that into my sky. And so that's what we have so far. The colors are pale. I know they look pale on my monitor, but they really are pale. So just to kind of give you... Here you can see it dry. It doesn't shift too much when it dries. If you look at the sky there, I just want to show you that you need that background pale so that as we build up, our like our everything will stand out and show on top because we're not keeping any areas white. In fact, I totally forgot to paint that to sketch our bridge in there, but we're gonna we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Yeah, ah. <laughs> see what you did there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just a miracle we're on the yeah. air right now. <laughs> Maybe we won't have a bridge. You don't have to have a bridge. The bridge is optional. It'd still be a lovely scene. It's actually a scene of uh, Budapest, uh, the Liberty Bridge in Budapest. Uh, I found the photo on Unsplash. I thought it was really pretty. So I'm taking some of that Geranium Lake, which is like a quid magenta color, and I'm going to pick up, uh, I think I'm going to grab a little bit of that orange that I just used, and then I am going to go over here and start painting in some very far away buildings. I'm using a small angle just so that I can easily like get some building shapes there without too much work. And just to interrupt, uh, a, a little creative, April, oh, is here in the chat. April. Thanks so. for joining us, April. If you guys have questions about these paints. Specifically, um, she is here to help. Yeah, yeah. And April, if you can keep your eye on the chat, if anybody, um, if anybody asks, if they, if they have questions about that, she can certainly... No, she knows better than I do on these paints because this is literally the second time I've played with them other than swatching them out. I'll share my swatches um, when we get to a point where I'm letting something dry so you can see. But, um, but yeah, they're really nice. Uh, oh, uh, do you know the so question? So, Kiken, Kiken, I was wondering if you could suggest a good professional watercolor brand that doesn't use cadmium in their pigments. Most pro lines will have um, will have some cadmium colors, but if you look for a hue, the word hue, then it won't contain cadmium. So that's you know you'd probably want to buy rather than buying a set, buy individual colors so you don't have to worry about getting a cadmium by mistake. Um, most June grade paints won't have cadmium in them because um, it's expensive, and you know as, if they're marketing to children, they obviously wouldn't want to have the cadmium in there. Um, it does seem like there was a cadmium free brand that actually talked about being cadmium free. I don't know if it would, gosh, I, I wouldn't want to tell you wrong, so I'm not hundred percent sure, but you can definitely avoid buying the cadmium paint in any range that you, that you want. I'm going to grab the orange and this is a cadmium orange, but you could use, um, you could use a pie roll orange, you could mix your own orange, completely up to you. And I'm going to put in another row of colors. Um, watch your brush, make sure you don't have any beads of water on the ferrule, because if they slide down, they're going to give you a puddle on your paper. I noticed I just have a little puddle there. you got to be careful with the with the, with getting 
drops on here because when you have an uneven tension of water in the surface of your paper, that's when you end up with your blossoms. And this, the only blossoms we want in this picture are our cherry blossoms when we get to that point. I'm just doing, I'm turning my brush on different edges to get different shapes of buildings. And you can have your skyline going up higher if you want to. And then I just kind of fade it out at the bottom so when I do my next row, I don't see like a hard edge of where the building stopped. So very gently just dragging out that paint. Uh, Puneeth Kumar, I sometimes struggle to blend black color in the painting. I love incorporating black in art. Any tips to make it easy to blend? Blend black in. I usually, if I'm going to use black, I would usually wait until I'm completely done and use it as a contrast color. So for blending, I guess I would suggest you mix everything off your paper. You like never bring the pure black to your paper, mix it on a palette, and then, um, and then bring it in already mixed. That said, I don't personally use black um, very often, so, and not like black watercolor paint, I would mix my own black. So um, that's something you could try. Mix, instead of using black, take two neutrals. So if you're painting something green and you want to have a shadow for it, instead of grabbing black, taking some like alizarin crimson and mixing it in. So it use its opposite so you get like kind of a natural black. I'm grabbing some yellow here and adding that into those orange buildings just to give it a little bit of a sun-kissed look. I thought the yellow, the orange looked a little dark, so that's going to tone it down a little bit. And again, just fading the bottom a little bit. Our next buildings are going to be purple. That purple is really strong, so make sure you have a rag handy that you can blot your brush on. So you take it, when you have a real dark color, you take your color, you get it on your palette, you add the water till you've got it diluted enough, and then you're going to blot that on your brush so you don't have too much. And then the yellow that's underneath is going to tone it down so you get kind of like a purpley gray. So see, our purple is not super, super dark here. And everything's nice and fuzzy because it's so far away. And as our paper dries, our um, buildings will become a little bit more crisp and then we'll get a little more detail. Oh, be careful not to stick your hand on the bottom of your painting. We can cover that up. We'll be adding a little more depth to the water, but it's just, uh, it's real easy to just set your hand on your painting and not realize it. Just remember to turn your brush, use different edges of it, and to fade out those buildings on the bottom. And since your paper is wet from the back too, you usually can fade it without adding any additional water. And these final buildings, I'm going to take a mixture of the, I'm going to take a little bit of the purple, I'm going to take some Prussian blue, they call it Paris blue in that set. You could also use a phthalo, but super diluted because phthalo is really strong. And you can throw in a little of that cobalt turquoise as well to kind of bring in some of the sky colors. So what you're ending up with is a muted um, kind of teal color. Get it mixed up to the right color on your palette and then uh, then blot your brush. I like that this palette doesn't beat up too. A lot of metal palettes will beat up for a while until you get them broken in. And after we get this kind of soft row of uh, buildings, we are going to need to dry it to get a little more detail in there. So that the uh, building's right on the edge of the, um, the skyline will show up. I'm going to throw in a little bit more of that orange color on some of the buildings down here before I dry it. So if you guys have any questions you've been holding on to, um, it would be a great time to ask when I am. Um, when I'm drying this, because usually the dryer doesn't come up. You can't hear that on film very well, so, but you can hear me answer your questions. And the orange there is going to keep our blue from being too vibrant. Okay.
Okay. I can also show my swatches while I am drying because people do love to see swatches. Yeah, swatches are fun. I gotta cut this out of my sketchbook. I was playing with this new sketchbook. Whoops. And bring it down like that. Um, so the colors are really vibrant. The ones on the top row are more earthy and have a little more opacity to them. And the ones on the bottom are more vibrant and more transparency. And there's actually a color called flesh tint, which is kind of like a light uh, milky peach color, which would be good for Caucasian skin. But there's also several browns there that would be good for, uh, for darker skin. And of course you can mix your colors to come up with different skin tones as well. Another thing I want to show you about my swatch, because someone sent me an email asking what to do with their little um, watercolor pans, because they had that wrapper on it and they were afraid they would get confused. What I recommend doing is taping them, taking the wrapper off your watercolor pans, taping them into your sketchbook, and then um, and then swatching right underneath it. So you'll have all your pigment and, and uh, color number information and um, everything right at your fingertips. You won't have to... Um, hunt for that. And you can always use a sharpie and write the information on the pans of color. Make sure you don't set your painting on into your puddle on your table, so you might want to stop and wipe that down, because you do need to dry both sides of the paper. dry it pretty evenly. It should take out any of the wrinkles. And here you can see on the bottom is where I laid my hand in the paper and didn't realize it, but I knew I was going to glaze over it with some more colors, so I didn't worry about it. But had that been perfect and I wasn't going to go over it, that would be an issue. So um, if you do that, what you'd want to do is get a damp, clean brush and just kind of go over it, or a damp brush that's got the color that you want and just go over it. But just try not to add more water to the paper than's already there. You want to maintain an even a wetness to your paper. So since this is dry, I really think you got to draw that bridge on there. And I'm just going to show you my painting here. And I am actually going to take that angle on the bottom of the bridge right from my painting. And this is how I would do that. I would set my painting up a little higher than the, uh, the thing I'm going to draw on. I'm going to take my ruler. I'm going to find that angle. Make sure these papers are horizontal to one another. Or, yeah, they're parallel to one another, rather. Figure out where I want that. I might want that a little bit there. A little bit lower. Make sure I have that angle. And then I'm going to use that for the bottom angle of my bridge. And then I'm going to put a perpendicular, or actually a line. It's not perpendicular to that, but it is going to be parallel to the edge of my paper, going up for from that for that uh, center beam. And if you get those two lines right, uh, everything else will fall into place really easily. Okay. That's probably a little tall, but that's all right. I'm going to put another one in here. Um, I'm going to get a parallel line for this. My paper is still a little cool to the touch. I know it's not 100% dry, but it'll be fine for sketching this on. But just be careful, if it's not 100% dry, you're not going to want to go doing any erasing yet. So if you have to erase, then just hold up before you do that. I'm going to get my swoop here. And then I'm going to kind of mimic that same angle over here and just bring it right off the edge of the page. And draw a little line to the other, the other little post I drew. And I'm going to bring that down and it's going to kind of meet up with that one the way the uh, perspective is and this one on this side is actually going to go below our first line that's a little high I'm not going to erase it yet but I am going to just make a little mark to show about how high I want to go and I'm going to thicken up this line and just draw a few lines just to show where I'm going to have the uh, posts 
on the front of the bridge. I probably won't draw the lines for the back of the bridge because I can I can freehand those in. And there we go. That's all we need for our bridge. But it's it's nice to have that in there when we're going to go paint the um, this little bit of abstract buildings in here, just so we kind of know how far we're going to go with that. Okay. Any other questions before we... We're all caught up. All right, I'm going to zap this a little bit more because I think it'll take that kind of lump out of the paper. Okay. All right, so I am going to grab my flat brush again. You could go to a bigger flat brush if you want to, but this is working fine for me. And that color that we mixed up earlier, which I dried out on my palette already. And I am going to put in a um, little bit of a water line. Just so I can get the edge of that river there. It's going to kind of, it would go behind our uh, bridge. Yeah, I'll switch to a bigger angle here. I've got one handy. And I'm going to have to be careful I don't slide my picture around. I'm going to mix up a little more of that color. So we had our cobalt turquoise, we had some Paris blue or Prussian blue, and we had a smidgen of violet. And I am just going to start making some cube shapes. Just to signify like the edges of roofs. I'm grab a little bit of the violet. And I'm gonna just brush a little bit in there. I just want to make sure it doesn't look like um, the water and it's got enough of a contrast there. And back to the smaller brush, grab some purple right from the pan. Oops, right there. Blot my brush so I don't have too much water, and I'm just going to throw in some windows. Just little marks like that. That's a little too much paint, so I'm going to go with a little bit less. And we don't need to have too much detail there. It's just to give it a little bit of um, a little bit of texture to show that something's happening back there. Very abstract. And if you feel like anything in the back needs a little more definition, like maybe that row of the purple buildings, you can do just very lightly uh, hit the edges, the top edges of them with your with your angle, your smaller angle brush. But I wouldn't do the pink and the orange bu uh, buildings because they would be further away and they'd be hazier and more out of focus. Now let's work on the bridge itself. We're going to use the cobalt turquoise. And we are going to go ahead and paint everything. I am going to start with this bottom part right here. It's easy to do that with a... With a um, angle because it's got the nice flat edge. Uh, Tiffany Venge, what do you do with all of your unsold paintings or paintings you don't feel are good enough to sell or even give away as gifts? Um, I, I sometimes I might like cut them up and turn them into bookmarks or um, I usually have, you know, bins at like art fairs and um, craft fairs and stuff with with other paintings. So I would just keep them in there. And somebody usually finds, you know, it's funny because the paintings that you might not think are great, other people will enjoy. So, yeah, I usually just throw them in my uh, my bin of stuff for craft fairs. But if I don't think it's good enough to sell, then I would um, I would chop it up, turn it to a bookmark, paint, do practice work on the backside. Something like that, so it doesn't go to waste. Or gesso it and do pastels on it. 
a lot of times when a paint when I feel like a painting is failing, I just keep pushing it. And I'll try different media and I'll do other things to it. So, um, so I usually don't have ones that completely go to waste. Now I'm giving the other side of the bottom of this bridge. I'm just freehanding that freehanding that in with my brush, and I'm just going to smudge some of that color in there. So we've got the side closest to us with the post. We've got the side the bottom, and now we're going to go in and throw those uh those little posts in the back. And you can thicken these up with a, with a um, round brush if you want to. And I want to get a little bit of detail up here at the top of the bridge. I think that's probably enough for now on that. I may go in and add a little bit more, but I want to see how that looks after I've uh, worked on it for a bit. And um, there is a part under the bridge that's kind of holding it up, but it kind of get lost, gets lost in the shadows and when we put our, um, our trees down there. So I don't really want to do that just in case it ends up being unnecessary or ends up actually fighting against what we're going to do. So now I'm going to grab some of the Paris blue here. And I'm going to add some of the cobalt turquoise to it so that um, it doesn't seem really out of place. And I'm going to start this under the bridge here. And I'm going to go even right over where I had some of the land area because that would be just dark and shadowy. And I'm just gently flicking it out. I'm using a synthetic brush. This is a, um, a Royal Langnickel Majestic. So it's like a kind of like a tackle-on. It is a tackle-on brush. I'm using that so I don't end up getting too much water. I'm going to start it in from the corner here. And also because the bristles are a little bit stiffer, it will um, it'll push the paint around without me having to have too much water. And I can go on the edge of it if I want some ripples. And I'm going to try to keep any visible strokes horizontal with like parallel with the bottom of my paper. Since a lot of this is going to be covered over um, when we put our branches in. I'm not going to fret about it, but I do want to get some of that dark color in there. Let me shadow under the bridge. Uh, a little creative. Are stiffer brushes better for dry brushing techniques? Yeah, definitely, because uh, the softer brushes will just flop over when you're trying to dry brush. You need that stiffer brush to, to be able to push the paint when you've got not a lot of water. I'm going to do a little bit of that up here on the shoreline too. Just to define it. I don't want too def defined because it is far away. But I want a little bit there. And then I'm just going in with a little watery cobalt turquoise just to kind of spread it around a little bit. And we can always adjust that later too. We just want to kind of get a, a nice base in. Okay, so the next thing we're going to work on is actually our um, our branches, and we are going to mix a nice dark for that. We are going to use um, we can mix with our synthetic brush here. It's better to mix with a stiffer brush too, because you won't get so much water in there. I'm going to use my cad orange and my Paris Blue. It's going to give me a really nice dark. It's going to give me a fairly transparent dark. Even though the Cat Orange is a little bit opaque, that Paris Blue is so strong that it is going to make it very, very inky. And then the brush you use to paint your branches is completely up to you. You might want to use a flat and use it on its chisel edge like I'm going to do here. Or you could use a dagger or a liner or a round. Sometimes I'll use like a, if I have to do a long straight line, I like to use a flat or an angle. But if I'm doing kind of rough, uh, rough branches, I often like to go with a round or something where I'm going to have um, 
where it's going to hold a little bit more water. Let me grab this one here. I was going to bring the exact brush with me. I had like everything all, all laid out and then I got a little sidetracked. <laughs> I was painting upstairs to do my practice piece on in my office and uh, then I got distracted because it's so nice outside so I had to go outside and lay in the sun for a little while and then I was like oh my gosh it is time to, <laughs> to get the show on the road. It's because it's really nice out and it's very oh, easy to be distracted today. It's so nice and it's going to be nice tomorrow. It's supposed to be good all weekend. Oh good. Yeah, Father's Day is Sunday. Go down and visit my dear old dad. Yeah, you're going to have a cookout dinner or something like that? <laughs> to quote my father, if God wanted us to eat outside, he wouldn't have invited houses and restaurants. <laughs> All right, so you'll be eating indoors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not a barbecue fan. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, to each his own. Yeah. I like the atmosphere of a barbecue. I'm not keen on barbecue food, but, um, mm. but with yeah, it's it's not too many things you barbecue as a vegetarian. I mean, vegetables are good, like in a packet and stuff, yes. but they're also good in an oven, so it doesn't you don't have as much of a yeah. But there's fewer dishes to clean when yes. you do it on the grill because yes. you just put them in an aluminum foil pack. Yes, I do like that. I do appreciate that. And I mean, as much as you love dishes, <laughs> the dishwasher. But pans, you can't put pans in the dishwasher, or you can, but they don't seem to come up very clean. <laughs> I've got a big branch reaching up into the sky. So all those nice light pastel sunset colors that we had in there are going to look so nice behind our dark branches. And I'm going to put a little more orange in my dark here to warm it up a little bit. Now we can deepen up this color with some colored pencils in a bit. Um, so don't worry if you're not getting it dark enough. Um, that's actually fine because we're gonna be putting on our flowers and you know it's it's better to have fewer branches because you can't get rid of them once they're there really because we have such a dark color going on. Um, so don't worry if you're not, if your branches aren't dark enough. We can adjust those later. We'll adjust the, we'll, we'll uh, darken up the ones that we really want to be prominent. I feel like this tree looks a little more menacing than the tree. <laughs> Maybe it's because there's no flowers on it yet, I hope. Probably. A little, a little scary here. <laughs> okay, that's that's enough to get us started for our branches. Now we are gonna spatter on some of that beautiful magenta color, which is called Geranium Lake. There is no pigment information on the um, on the pans themselves so maybe april has that on her etsy shop i'm not sure um so since she's here april if you have that information uh let us know if we can find it on your website that would be really cool and if you don't have it then you know we could let us know that too i've never heard of these paints before it was really uh they're really fun i am using a soppy um juicy brush to flick on some of that geranium lake and if you do want to protect an area just put your hand down and, and cover it, but I think these blossoms can really spill out everywhere. Um, they look, I think they look really good. And this is a great way to get them, get them going without fretting about where you're gonna put every tiny little blossom because there's so many of them. This is just a great way to kind of get out of your own head and get some blossoms down. Creative Planet Janet. So is making the warm orange buildings out of focus the way to bring the blue buildings more forward? Yeah, it, it, it is. I mean, usually you're, you think of your warm colors as coming forward, but in this situation, you've got the sun going down behind those buildings, so they're kind of making those glow. So them being out of focus tells your brain to further away. The bridge being in sharp focus tells, it, tells us that's closer. So now what I'm going to do is get a round brush. Um, you might want to use a firmer synthetic. Use what you have, but if you find that you can't get your, um, your paint thick enough, then go ahead and use a synthetic. Um, and I'm just going to dab around where those spatters are, and that's going to give me my blossoms. Now this set came with a titanium white, which is uncommon in watercolor. Usually they're Chinese white, which is more of like a mixing white. Um, titanium white is a more opaque white. Uh, so if you don't have an, a titanium white and your Chinese white isn't cutting it, then um, get one of your acrylic round brushes. Please don't use your 
watercolor brushes with your acrylics, but just get some or white gouache and um, you can use white gouache with your with your watercolors and that will be the same thing. So uh, what you're gonna do is you're gonna dab around where you had those spatters and that paint is going to kind of flow in there and you're gonna end up with these multicolored blossoms, which is what you want. Uh, Linda Smith, are there any specific needs we should have on hand for your new watercolor class? Um, well, actually, I did want to answer a question about that because somebody had, had sent, put a message up in the classroom whether they needed a couple of the specialty brushes. So I do recommend a couple brushes, one being a dagger, uh, and, which is like an angle brush, but it's got really long bristles, and the other one being a deer foot stippler. And what I say is if you have those brushes, that's great. If you want to pick them up, that's wonderful. But if you don't, you can always watch the lesson. There's a couple lessons that use those brushes. And, um, and see if you like them. So those would be the only two things you probably might not have already would be a, a deer foot stippler um, brush, a quarter inch deer foot stippler, and a, a like three eighths, a quarter to a three eighths inch dagger brush. Um, and if you have those brushes and you've been wondering what the heck to do with them, we're actually gonna be doing some flowers with them, which is, um, which is just a really neat effect. You get these long, crepey um, petals with them. Think, think of like a, how a poppy has those, those crepey, um, floppy petals or think of like um, like an oriental peony how it's got those crepey petals we're going to be doing doing that sort of effect with those brushes or with the uh, with the dagger brush and uh, I actually just ordered a triangle brush which and somebody had asked me to paint um, a clematis clematis flower clematis mm -hmm. um, and so I will be I have, I will be adding that lesson in there uh, but then again you could watch it and see if you want to even to do it it's kind of a bonus I keep thinking of different things I want to add so that, that I have a feeling that's one of those classes that's going to get really big <laughs> but hey I figure it you know if you don't like a flower you don't care about painting you don't have to watch it it's better to have it yep. than you know and then uh, not have it now I'm also going to spatter in some of that white so I get some kind of more random looking splotches uh, Danielle Grader can you use your watercolor brushes with gouache yes Absolutely. You may find that you prefer a stiffer brush with gouache because you tend to use it thicker and more opaquely, but you absolutely can. A little creative. Have you tried the triangular brush? Not yet. I just ordered one and it hasn't come yet, but I'm expecting it um, by Tuesday, I think. That was my uh, Jerry's Artorama shipping confirmation. And I'm probably going to be kicking myself because I found some on clearance and I, I'm probably gonna wish I ordered 20 for a class, but I only ordered a couple just to try them out. Uh, Leah Gaffer, when I mix a gray using burnt sienna and ultramarine blue, after a while of mixing and then leaving it alone, it starts separating on its own. Do you have any solutions or do you know why? I'll just remix it. It's because they're both sedimentary colors and um, they're also inorganic colors, so they, they don't really mix. Those pigments are still individual little pigments. Um, when, you, when you paint with them, when you mix them together, they're still, they're, they don't combine. You know, they don't really mix. They're more, of a, um, they're more of a solution than a mixture. So yeah, they will separate. Um, and sometimes they separate on the paper, which is really pretty. That's why I love that combination because of how they dry. If you're in a really wet wash, they separate and they just have a really pretty texture. Um, so now just give them a mix before you pick them up with your brush. Just sway your brush around there and get them moving again. And, and that would be my, my suggestion. I'm a movie quoter. Are there any good resources for learning perspective? Um, I think your best bet with perspective is to get out there and draw what you see. Go out in the world, draw what you see, hold up a piece of um, plex plexiglass and draw with a dry erase marker and just make sure you don't move your head around when you do it and that will give you a great um, some great lessons on perspective um, I, I touch on perspective a little bit in my learn to draw with Lindsay class but I'm not a big fan of gimmicks and formulas because the formulas don't always work when you're out in the real world trying to draw something so I recommend just drawing what you see and practicing that's gonna that's gonna teach you more than than any formula or gimmick. So I'm just going to tip this because there's quite a bit of glare on there. And I think I'm going to dry this because it's going to be hard to go further and see. I do want to put a few more blossoms down here at the bottom. And we're also going to want to get some of our sunset colors um, on here because you would have like some of those light white petals are going to have pick up some of the sunset golden oranges and yellows. 
But to do that while it's all wet could just make a kind of a muddy, muddy mess. That's why I didn't mix my, the white and the pink on the palette. I'm kind of flicking and dabbing and letting them mix on the paper so they stay nice and fresh. All right, we'll give this a quick dry. Any questions while I'm drying here? We're caught up at the moment. Oh, great. But that doesn't mean we won't have some more fun. <laughs> You can go ahead and grab some colored pencils if you think you might want to add a little colored pencil to your composition. I'm going to be adding some Prussian blue watercolor pencil and also black, white, and magenta colored pencil. the Arteza or Arteza Arteza set of 24 and there's also a set of 12 by Lucas that's really inexpensive so I think the Arteza 24 is like 18 or 19 dollars and I think the Lucas set of 12 is like um, eight or nine dollars it goes on sale so I'm not sure I think I paid around seven for it on sale but um, but both of those are good. I find that gouache, it's easier to find a good inexpensive gouache than it is like a good inexpensive watercolor. Um, I'm not sure exactly why, but it does seem to be the, the way it is. So I'm gonna take this, um, let's see, yep, Prussian blue, and I'm gonna shade under my, um, under my bridge. Now that I can see where the branches are, that's why I wanted to wait until I had the branches in because I didn't want to just have this band of dark color. So I'm sheeting under the bridge and then I'm going to pull some of that color out on the left hand side of my paper. But I'm going around the blossoms because I want the blossoms to have some contrast and I want them to stand out a little bit more. And I didn't want to use masking fluid, which you could have used masking fluid for all of that instead of the white and then um, painted everything, peeled off your masking fluid and then dabbed your um, magenta color over there. But I didn't want to do that. so. Um, so that's why I'm doing it this way. Uh, Barusiva, why are you doing this as a small painting? Um, well, because I can fit my, uh, this would be great as a big painting, but I can fit the whole palette and my whole painting in frame. When I, if I was to do it big, it's so tall, it's such a tall composition that um, I'd have to be zoomed way out and there would be a lot of, there would be a lot of space outside of my palette and the painting. So um, I just thought it would, it would work a little bit better on YouTube that way. Uh, Tiffany Vang, I know you recommend Windsor and Newton Cotman for a student set, but is it safe to use them with middle aged school children? Um, I would. Middle age, uh, middle school is, they should be smart enough not to eat their paint. And yeah, I have. I mean, I would even use them with younger kids if you're going to be there watching them. They, the, the modern Cotman colors do not contain any more co uh, cobalt or cadmium. They used to, but I don't know if it was because of safety or because of um, cost. They stopped using real cobalt and cadmiums like in the 90s, I think. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate to, personally. Uh, Leah Gaffer, is there any reason you don't use masking fluid very often? Um, I just don't like it. I don't like the hard edge that um, that I get when I use it. I don't like waiting for it to dry. The reason I love watercolors is I can just get painting like as soon as I want to. And when, when I have to add steps, time consuming steps and waiting around for things, I get distracted and I, and I don't 
stick with a project. So it just doesn't work with my workflow, how I prefer to paint. But um, I will on occasion, um, but it's just not, uh, not my favorite, not my favorite thing. I don't enjoy the process of masking. So now I'm going to grab this white colored pencil and I'm going to add some highlight onto the top part of the, um, of the bridge there. And I am going to, I'm actually going to grab some of that Prussian blue and add that to shade some of my bridge here. And this is the watercolor pencil. You don't have to dissolve your watercolor pencil. If you want a crisp line and um, you want to leave it as is, you can totally do that. Or you can even use a regular colored pencil for this, but I've got the Prussian blue right here. That's the color I wanted, so I'm just going to use what I already have out. And because I feel like I lost my other painting, the bridge was darker. So I'm just going to go with that Prussian blue underneath the white line that I just made with a pencil to make it stand out a little bit. And I'm going to smooth out the bottom of my line there because I wasn't very careful when I diluted my watercolor pencil and I got the bottom of my bridge a little messed up. Uh, Bryn Friel, where do you like to source your, your cello bags and mats? Um, I cut my own mats, but the bags I get from Paper Mart, and I've also got them from Uline, and I've also bought some from Jerry's Artorama. Uh, when you buy from Paper Mart, you have to get like 500 or 1,000, so it takes a long time to use them up. Um, but I did get some 11 by 14s from Jerry's Artorama a couple of years ago when they were on a, they must have been overstocked or something because they had a really good price. So, you know, I would, I would look around. If you only need a hundred or less, you're better off to get it from like an art, like a Jerry's Artorama or um, a shop like that because they're not going to charge you big shipping fees because like all these stores like Uline and Paper Mart have um, separate shipping fees. It can be pricey for not ordering a lot. Um, now, I don't have the magenta that I used because I left it upstairs and that was a Prismacolor one and I have my Albright Drewer and I have my Polychromos down here, but ironically, uh, I do not see, oh wait, this one's pretty good, I think. I don't have a magenta like I did before. I think that will be all right though. So what I'm gonna do, I'm actually gonna do the white first. I am gonna go, th go around and I'm gonna look at all these different shapes where I have flowers and I'm just gonna kind of scribble some roughly edges on some of these, especially if I have a blob and I don't, you know, you can't really tell there's blossoms there. So any of these blobs, you just kind of scribble around some like ruffly circles basically, or even just scribbles, you know, just cause you wouldn't have every flower facing you. So you just basically want to get some of that fluffy texture in there and you can go in and add more paint uh, too. So, you know, nothing you're doing here is like your final step and you can't do anything else to it. So just keep that in mind. Uh, Amelia Gren, I got Schminky watercolors with a toxicity warning for the Nepal yellow and chrome yellow. Are there many toxic colors still used today and should they be avoided? No, they shouldn't be avoided and they're not really that toxic, but there are, you know, there is labeling uh, laws where they have to tell you if any of that chemical is in there, even if it's in such a small amount that you would have to eat five tubes of paint to have any adverse effects, um, especially with like if they want to sell their their paints in certain countries or they want to sell them in California, they have to have these labels. There's a lot of, there's some companies like American Crafts that puts a label on everything they sell because they're so afraid of getting sued by by um, California. So don't let that stop you. Um, you know, if you have young children, I would definitely, you know, not leave it where they can reach it, of course, you know, you don't, because kids will, you know, get it all over themselves, you know, if they don't know what it is, they'll be, they're curious, right? So. You know, if you're using the paint the way it's intended to be used, you have nothing to worry about. If you're, you know, dipping your paint, your, your paintbrush in your coffee and then drinking it, <laughs> then, you know, that's not the best. It probably isn't still enough to make you sick, but, you know, it's probably not a risk worth taking. But yeah, there's still lots of toxic pigments because they are light fast and a lot, a lot of toxic pigments are light fast. I'm sorry, go on. What, what no, I thought you were done. Um... Lindsay, where do I find triangle brush brushes and dagger brushes? Um, the dagger brushes are pretty easy to find in any like art shop or craft shop. The triangle brushes are a little bit trickier. I just found mine that I ordered on Jerry's Artorama. Silver Brush makes them and um, Best, B-E-S-T-E, makes them. 
and I know Rosemary and Company also sells them, but they're a European shop, and I didn't want to order from overseas and have to pay extra. Plus, I don't think they offer a synthetic option, and um, I prefer to get the synthetic, um, the synthetic um, squirrel brushes. So that was just a personal choice, although I've heard their brushes are excellent, so if that's not an issue you have, um, I know other people have said their triangle brush is just divine. Uh, and it's not like you're gonna, you know, it's a buy it once type of thing. So with watercolor brushes, you're not, you know, you're not having to replace them because watercolor's so gentle. Okay, so now I'm feeling like, um, I think I'm gonna go ahead and grab either some really dark brown or a black pencil. And I am going to look at my branches and figure out where I really want to accent lines and maybe any place I want to um, add a few more little bitty pretty branches I can do that as well now I, I recommend Prismacolor and that's what I was using upstairs in my office and I have to say even these color softs next to Prismacolor I feel like I'm drawing with chalk because Prismacolors are so creamy it also makes them more likely to break so that's the downside to those markers uh, those pencils but um, I feel like I have to push a lot harder to get to get the level of saturation and color with other with other um, brands like the Polychromos or the Color Soft. I haven't tried the Pro Color because I don't think I'd like them um, based on what other artists have mentioned about them. Just being harder, I like a soft pencil. I'm not doing lots of layers and detail and stuff. Barusiva is the triangle brush like Princeton Cat's Tongue brush. It's, it's similar in the fact that you can get some really neat strokes and effects that you wouldn't get with like a typical round or angle or flat. So that's why I'm really excited about trying it. I don't have one and I haven't used one yet. So I am very excited to play with it. I or actually ordered, um, cause the best ones were on clearance. Uh, I ordered two, they had a size six and a size eight and they were both for about two bucks a piece. So I ordered two of each of those so I could have one downstairs in my studio and one upstairs in my office or I put one in my travel bag if I really loved it. And I ordered one of the silver uh, faux squirrel ones um, because I've heard, heard those are really excellent. They are more money so I didn't want to buy two if I didn't like them. Uh, but yeah, so I'm really excited. I haven't tried them yet, but I think they're going to be similar to, to a cat's tongue brush in the fact that they just they hold a lot of paint and water and they have a nice sharp tip and uh, the, I've just seen some lovely flowers done with them and they just look so effortless when they when they make the strokes. I think it would just be, it would be interesting. It would be, and it, and it makes a unique stroke that would take you like a couple strokes with a round and it wouldn't look as, as fluid and effortless. So that's something I've wanted to, wanted to try and I finally, finally ordered it because I didn't have it at any of my local you, you stores. You got it at Jerry's? I got it at Jerry's. Yeah, I ordered it from Jerry's. And I think I'm going to sharpen this and then just do a few details on the bridge to make it stand out a little bit more. Hopefully, these color shops I think are a little bit fatter. I'm hoping they fit in this sharpener. Oh, yeah, they do. Oh, goodness, I broke the tip. I have an electric sharpener upstairs <laughs> because I always seem to break the pencils when I sharpen them in a handheld one. Even when I try to turn the sharpener, but that's so awkward. Oh my goodness, I think that sharpener fell. Yeah, I'm afraid to sharpen this more. I'm afraid it's going to break on me, but I it with like a sharper tip. That's the downside to the softer pencils is that you've got to deal with with more breakage. Um, all right, so I am just going to give my bridge a little more definition. Um, I don't have my pencil really sharp, but I can see where it had broken in the sharpener. I have a little bit of a of a nice sharp tip in there, like edge. So I'm just using that edge to get a little bit of a um, get a little bit of a sharp line, so I can just kind of hit the um, the edges of those poles. Just give it a little bit of definition. I don't want it to be super prominent, but I do want it to stand out a little bit. And then for a final, for a final touch, I think I will go in. Maybe I'll actually, because I have my white pens up here. I'll go and use this actually. 
I forgot, I didn't have these downstairs, so I can go in and add just really subtle highlights with this. I probably want to get it started going a little bit more. It's not flowing. I might need to refill that again. I've been using it a lot lately. Oh, there we go. So this turned into kind of a mixed media piece, but that's okay. It's mostly watercolor, a little bit of colored pencil, a little bit of white paint. I like the extra texture you can get in there with the um, mixed media supplies. Oh, maybe I'll grab my pink pen as well. That would be pretty. I haven't used it in a while. There we go. Get it flowing. And so when I'm adding something new like this, like a new color, I'll just be really light, just little dainty um, strokes here and there. But you do, once you started, you do need to kind of carry it through um, the rest of the painting. Oh, and we haven't put our glow onto these yet. We want to put a little bit of yellow and orange paint onto these blossoms. But with the acrylic and the colored pencil, we don't have to worry because it's not going to be disturbed by going over with watercolor. It'll stay stay true where it is. You could take a little more time. I like kind of scrawling around loosely with my pens. Uh, Aliyah Nelson, do you prefer the Posca pen or normal acrylics? Pos I, well, it depends on what I was doing. I'm, I don't typically paint with acrylics that much. But I do use acrylics a lot for like base coating things or painting on crafts or like doing an underpainting for an oil. So it would totally depend if I was going to like, but as far as mixed media, I like the pens because I tend to do the, the majority of the painting with watercolor or gouache. So going over the, the pens for any time I need a detail just works out really, really well. But everybody's different and everybody has their own preferences. acrylics dry in a jiffy. Now I'm going to grab a little bit of yellow. This is gamboge here, although it doesn't look like gamboge to me. It looks more like a like a Hansi yellow. And I am just going to add it to some of these flowers. Be careful as you're going around the blue area though because you don't want to get it in the water you just want this to be kind of like the sunset reflecting on the flower buds just like kind of getting you know if you look at a like a white petal flower like an apple blossom or something and it you know the sun's going down it's going to capture the colors around it. it's going to capture that light and that's what we're just kind of just rimming our flowers with this just getting that little capture of the of the uh, sunset color here i'm going to grab a little bit of the cad orange and mixing it in And I'm going to dab that here and there. And the orange, you got to be careful with the orange on the blue because it could go uh, muddy because orange and blue are opposites. You probably see a little bit more of the orange up higher in the sky. But since our sky is so light, we really don't have to worry about it getting any of those colors. If you feel like you want a little bit more of that pure um, magenta color, you can go in with that. Just pick it right off from the pan and you can dab it anywhere you want. Um, if, it, if you go on top of the colored pencil, it'll kind of bead up, but that's all right. It'll seep into the paper next to it and it'll be fine. Or it will seep into the little, um, the valleys where the colored pencil doesn't hit. So it's not going to really stick on top of the colored pencil, but it usually can find its way down to the paper somehow. We have any questions before we wrap it up here? We're all caught up. 
Wonderful. Oh, uh, Alea Nelson. Well, I'd be able to rewatch this after you're done. Absolutely, the replays are always available. I believe this person is new. I don't. I oh don't yeah, well, welcome, welcome. Always nice to have new people joining us in painting. Yep, the, sometimes the replays aren't immediately available on YouTube, um, but they're always av immediately available on my blog. Sometimes YouTube wants to process them before they make them public to viewers, but um, but they're always available on my blog. And um, this should be ready very shortly when the stream's over on YouTube. So, and there you go. I'll bring this one over here because it's all completely dry. Um, our flowers are still a little wet there, but... Um, it was really fun. I would, would try it larger if you wanted to. Uh, I think it would be really pretty done as a bigger painting. In fact, this would be really pretty done in acrylics on a canvas. So if you're going to do this on um, in oils or acrylics on a canvas, there's a couple ways you could do it. Um, one way would be to get out your colors but also have white on your palette. And um, I would go right ahead and paint the whole... Uh, I would paint the canvas with white and maybe even a little blending medium and then I would paint or if you're using oils just just paint it white with a little paint thinner uh, to thin it down so you don't use up your whole tube of white and then I would pick up a little bit of that teal on your brush and brush that in and then clean your brush get a little bit of the yellow brush that in clean your brush pick up a little bit of the orange and just gently add those colors in and then if you're doing acrylics Wait for that background to dry at the same point where we dried it with a heat tool. If you're in oils, um, let it set up overnight at least. It probably won't dry, but you at least want it to be to that kind of tacky stage. And then um, go over and paint your bridge and then your your flowers. So you to, this is this is done in a progressive technique where we're layering. So you could do this in whatever media you want to um, in the same fashion. So if you're not a big watercolor fan and you want to try it in acrylics or oils or gouache or pastel, go right ahead because the techniques are going to be the same for this particular painting. All right, uh, links to everything are in the video description. Um, and my new watercolor floral class is 50% off till the end of the month. There's a link to that as well. So uh, if you were curious, I always put my, my classes on the best price that they'll ever be will be that first month I launch them so that my fans get the best deal. Um, so if you want that, don't miss out on 50% off. Do you have anything to add? No, nope, all set. All right, have a wonderful weekend. Have a happy Father's Day if you're a father. And um, till next time, happy grafting.